This happened to me on July 4, 2006. Name's Mike Holden. I've been a search and rescue officer in Yosemite National Park longer than most folks stick with anything these days. Married, two kids, a dog, a mortgage, you know, a normal guy. Well, as normal as anyone gets after facing down the things I've faced in these woods. A missing persons call came in, late afternoon. A pair of experienced hikers, man and woman, failed to check back in from a planned multi-day trek on a remote trail in the park's backcountry. Routine procedure, gear up, radio the rangers, grab my partner Anne, and set out. Even with the holiday crowds in the valley, I figured we'd find them holed up with twisted ankles by morning, cursing their bad luck and swearing off the wilderness for good. The trail wound deeper into the ancient forest, the cheerful tourist chatter dropping away with every mile. Yosemite is big, awe-inspiring, the kind of place that makes you feel small. That day, though, it felt different, oppressive even. The air felt heavy, thick with the scent of pine needles and damp earth, but no birdsong, no insects buzzing, just a thick silence that settled in my bones. Anne looked nervous, glancing at the dense trees as if they hid some unseen threat. I reassured her, mostly for my own benefit. We hit the spot where the hikers should have set up their last camp, their tent was torn down, ransacked. Supplies were strewn everywhere, food wrappers scattered like confetti. We both saw the smeared bloodstains on a rock, and the feeling in my gut turned to ice. I radioed it in, my voice steady with a professionalism drilled into me through years on the job. Anne looked pale. She was fresh out of training. This was her first real case. I sent her back down the trail to secure the area. Didn't want her seeing what I suspected we might find. I found the man first. What was left of him, rather. I won't go into the grisly details. Let's just say... It wasn't an accident. Bear. Cougar. You name it. I'd seen the aftermath of nature's brutal side. And this was something else entirely. The sheer violence of it. The wounds. They sent a chill through me even after all my time on the job. It was calculated, driven by a viciousness that seemed almost angry. I heard a noise behind me, a low, guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. Whirled around, rifle raised. And that's when I saw it, crouched in the shadows under a massive redwood. The biggest damn thing I've witnessed to this day a hulking figure standing easily seven feet on powerful hind legs. Its body was covered in dense dark fur, corded with muscles that rippled with its every breath. And its eyes, those eyes glowed a chilling amber in the dim light, filled with a chilling mix of animal instinct and cunning intelligence. Before I could process what I was seeing, it charged with a speed that defied its size. Its roar tore from its throat, a mix of animal shriek and something far more disturbing. A sound that echoed in my bones. I fired off a shot, more out of shock than any real hope of stopping it. Roaring in pain, it momentarily recoiled. I took the chance and ran, stumbling through the trees, crashing through foliage. The creature's furious bellows echoed through the forest behind me, each one driving me harder. I must have tripped, blacking out for a moment, when I came to, I was tangled in a thicket of thorny bushes, a sharp pain throbbing in my leg. Above me, the creature was sniffing the air, its breath coming in ragged gasps. It circled, its frustration radiating through the silent forest. With a supreme effort, I stayed hidden while it stalked off, confused by my sudden disappearance. Its footsteps faded further into the woods, leaving a terrified silence in their wake. By the time Anne and Backup found me, I was a shivering mess, barely holding it together. I told them about the man, about the blood, and finally, faltering, I described what attacked us. Their faces went from concerned to skeptical, like they were sizing me up as a trauma case. Official report put it down to an animal attack, the hiker's deaths unsolved. Nobody but Anne believed me about what I swore I saw. I don't blame them. 
It sounds like the stuff of nightmares, a monster from campfire tales. But they called Anne and me heroes that day for finding the surviving hiker, the woman. She never spoke of what attacked them. Her eyes haunted. Trauma can do funny things to the mind. I haven't gone into that area since. Most folks think I'm avoiding the bad memories. And yeah, those are burned into my brain for good. But mostly, it's that feeling of being watched, of sensing something moving in the shadows just beyond my sight. The knowledge that something lurks out there. Something old and powerful and very, very angry. The locals tell stories, passed down from the tribes who knew these lands long before us. Tales of the Wendigo, the forest spirit, driven by an ancient hunger, a vengeful creature forever on the hunt. I don't know if I believe in those stories exactly, but I know what I saw, and more importantly, I know it saw me too. And some nights, when the wind whispers through the trees, I still swear I can feel its eyes on me, waiting. This happened to me on October 12th, 2002. I can still picture the way the leaves had flamed red and gold along the highway, the feeling of crisp air and that peculiar tang of wood smoke that hangs around in the fall. I'm Wes Johnson, search and rescue, Yellowstone National Park. Been at it for close to a decade back then. You get to know these woods pretty well after a while. At least you think you do. Routine call that morning. Elderly couple gone missing. Hadn't checked out of the lodge on time. That stretch of forest near the park boundaries isn't exactly wilderness. Marked trails, lots of weekend hikers. Figured it was two old folks who got turned around. Maybe one of them took a bad fall. The usual, sadly. Partner had the day off, so I headed out on my own. I drove out to the trailhead, radioed in, and started along the path. October can be a funny month, weather-wise. Started off sunny enough, then by mid-afternoon, the clouds had rolled in. That big, bruised sky right before a storm. Maybe half a mile in, I saw her. The woman. She lay sprawled off the trail, tangled up in some low branches. I ran over. She wasn't moving. A jolt of fear shot through me as I checked for a pulse. None. Not a breath. Her face was pale an ugly gash across her forehead. I looked around wildly, half expecting to find the husband. He was further down the trail, slumped against a tree. Eyes closed, but with a shallow rise and fall to his chest. I fumbled for the radio, calling in the casualties, requesting backup and medical evacuation. That's when I saw it. Blood splatter on the tree, and a drag mark leading off the trail and into the trees. He hadn't just collapsed. Something had pulled him out of sight. My pulse hammered in my head. Whatever it was, it could still be out there, watching. I drew my gun and moved cautiously into the undergrowth, following the drag marks. It was slow going, the forest floor a tangle of leaves and fallen branches. The drag marks ended abruptly at a small clearing. And that's when I saw the elk carcass. Most of it was already gone. Ragged chunks of flesh and bone lay scattered like some grotesque picnic. At first, I thought a mountain lion must have made the kill, but something was wrong. The carcass wasn't just torn. It was shredded, as if something immensely powerful had ripped it apart. A low growl echoed from behind the trees. My blood ran cold. I crouched and raised my gun, scanning the dim green light between the trunks for any sign of movement. That was when it broke out of the thicket, and every stupid thought about bears or mountain lions vanished from my brain. It was massive, easily eight feet at the shoulder, moving on all fours with a lumbering, ape-like gait. Thick, coarse fur matted with gore and dirt mottled its dark hide. Its arms were enormous, ending in ragged claws. But the worst was the head. Flat-faced, jutting jaw lined with bone-snapping teeth, 
and eyes as black and cold as an oil slick. It glared at me, a mix of hunger and savage cunning burning in its gaze. A bear, twisted and wrong. That's the best description I could come up with, even in the shock of that moment. It snarled, another deep guttural sound that made my skin prickle. I fired once, twice, hitting it square in the shoulder. Blood sprayed, and it roared in pain, but it didn't go down. Instead, it charged straight at me, the ground trembling beneath its bulk. I turned and ran, scrambling back through the trees. Branches tore at my face, my boots slipped on the wet leaves. I could hear it crashing behind me, snapping branches and growling with rage. The rain began to fall, spattering my face and making the ground slick. I tripped, sprawling hard on the muddy ground. I thrashed around, gun flying from my hand. The creature loomed over me, its breath hot in my face. There was a feral reek to it, like old meat mixed with something chemical. I struggled to my knees, desperately reaching for my gun. It was just out of reach, half buried in the leaves. The creature opened its jaws, drool dripping from its fangs. A killing bite, and I was through. A scream tore out of my throat as it lunged. Then, a flicker of movement in the trees. Another shot rang out. The creature jerked, a snarl cut short. It whirled away and bolted back into the cover of the trees. My backup had arrived. A ranger named Laura, bless her soul. Her shots drove the creature away. She ran to my side, helping me to my feet. What the hell was that? Her voice was shaking. I don't know, I choked out. My legs were wobbling, my lungs burned like fire. We searched the area, but the creature had vanished. We never found a trace of it. The old couple became part of the file of missing persons. Unofficially, I'm convinced they didn't get lost out there. That creature... I think it hunted them. They say those woods hold secrets out there in the deep places where the maps go blank. Maybe they do. Maybe that thing's still out there. I like to think it's some kind of genetic experiment. Something man-made, explainable. Easier to swallow than the alternative. That maybe there are monsters in this world we don't even have names for. Let's just say... I never go into Yellowstone alone anymore. This happened to me on February 18, 1991. Even with the snow and winter chill, it's still a day I wish I could forget. I've been with the Forest Service, gosh, almost 20 years now. Love the quiet most of the time, you know? Helps clear your head and all that. But there are some days when the quiet turns against you. My name's Carter. Carter Myers. I patrol the Olympic National Forest in Washington State. That place is a real maze of green, even under a blanket of snow. That day the call came in about some snowmobilers who'd gone off the marked track and hadn't checked in. Probably got cocky. Thought they knew the terrain. The usual story. Parents bundled up, barely keeping it together at the ranger station. I could see one of their kids' faces in my head, a young boy maybe ten years old, smiling at the camera in their family photo. Didn't want to think what might happen if I didn't find him alive. Took me a couple of hours of careful scanning to pick up a trail. Finally found tire tracks curving off into the denser part of the woods. Figured they must have gotten disoriented and panicked taken a wrong turn, followed the trail, moving slow in case they were hurt. Then I saw it. One of the snowmobiles, upturned and mangled in a ditch, but there was no sign of the riders. My blood ran cold. I moved closer, scanning the area for signs of life, any footprints in the snow, anything. That's when I spotted the blood. The trail of red led deeper into the trees. I got off my snowmobile and started walking, my hand on my pistol just in case. Mountain lions weren't common in these parts, but they were a risk. The farther I walked, the worse the scene became. Torn fabric hung from branches, dark stains soaked into the snow. Something wasn't right about those marks. They were too big, too splattered. A wave of nausea hit me as I finally reached the clearing. 
It was a scene out of a nightmare. Half-devoured bodies lay scattered amidst the snow, twisted at unnatural angles. One was missing a leg, another had a gaping wound in their torso. Bile rose in my throat as the truth sunk in. This wasn't a cougar or even a bear. Suddenly, I heard a crash, a snarl, and something erupted from the undergrowth ahead of me. My heart hammered against my ribs as my mind struggled to make sense of what I was seeing. It was huge, hunched over on four legs but towering even in that crouching position. Its fur was dark and matted, tangled with what I realized with horror was fresh gore. Its head was wolf-like, but the mouth was stretched wide in a grotesque snarl, revealing a double row of razor-sharp teeth the size of my fingers. The eyes, those were the worst. They glittered yellow, full of hunger and predatory cunning. This was no animal I'd ever seen before. Before I could react, the creature lunged. I barely managed to dive to the side and scramble behind a tree. It slammed into the trunk, making the wood crack ominously. I felt a rush of freezing wind as it swiped a massive paw in my direction, its long claws raking inches from my face. My gun. I fumbled for it, hearing the beast circle the tree, its hot breath steaming on the bark inches from me. Got my pistol out and fired blindly around the trunk, heard a roar of pain. The thing retreated with a growl, giving me a moment to breathe. I broke cover and sprinted back for my snowmobile, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. Got on and tore back the way I had come, not caring about tracks or stealth. Something crashed through the branches behind me, the sound of it gaining rapidly. I glanced back just in time to see the beast leap, hurtling towards me through the air with monstrous speed. Twisted the handles, swerving just out of its path. This time, it landed square on the back of my snowmobile, its claws tearing into the metal. The vehicle bucked and swerved, almost throwing me off. The creature roared, its fetid breath washing over me. I fumbled desperately for my pistol, but it must have been knocked loose back at the tree. The beast swiped again, and I felt a searing pain on my shoulder, saw my jacket tear open, felt the warm slick of blood. Then the snowmobile hit a root, flipped, and I went flying. I crashed through branches and into a snowdrift, the impact driving the breath from my lungs. Everything spun in a vortex of white, then went still. For a heartbeat, I thought it might be over. Then I heard the snarling grow closer, the crunching footsteps in the snow. Summoning every last ounce of strength, I rolled, scrambled to my feet, saw the creature lumbering closer, a dark silhouette against the falling snow. I stumbled forward, slipping on the ice, blind with panic. My foot found something solid, my abandoned snowmobile, lying half buried. I grabbed onto the wreckage and heaved with every bit of muscle I had left. The overturned vehicle shifted, groaned, but held firm. The beast was almost on me, its reeking breath hot against my neck. One final desperate push and the entire snowmobile tipped forward just as the creature lunged for the kill. It slammed into the heavy hunk of metal, snarling with surprise. My vision blurred, but I grabbed the gas tank, ripped a fuel line loose, and somehow managed to fumble for my lighter. A spark, a flare of flame, and a torrent of gasoline ignited right in the creature's face. It roared, a terrible wounded sound, thrashing against the burning machine. Seizing my chance, I stumbled back, gasping for air and ran blindly into the trees. I didn't stop running until I reached the ranger station just as dusk was settling in, told them what had happened, called in every backup unit I could think of. The parents. I don't think I've ever seen such heartbreak. We searched for a week straight, but never found even a trace of the snowmobilers or anything confirming what I saw. The higher-ups told the public it was an animal attack. Maybe a rogue bear woken early from hibernation. No one would believe the truth. There are things out there that the guidebooks don't warn you about. Things that slip between the trees unseen. Me? Well, I'm sure not retiring anytime soon. 
I figure I owe it to those folks I couldn't find, and every other hiker or snowmobiler out there to keep watch, in case that, that beast or something like it, ever comes back. Maybe a Sasquatch. Yeah, something like that. This happened to me on July 4, 2006. Name's Warren. Search and rescue in Sequoia National Forest. Born and raised around here. Figured if anyone was prepared for the backwoods, it was me. Turns out, nothing can prepare you for some things. I was called out late afternoon for an overdue hiker. Brianna, a solo camper with a weekend permit. Her friends got worried when she didn't text like she promised. Seemed routine enough. Hiker got turned around lost track of time. The usual. Found myself hoping it was just a dead cell phone, that she'd be tucked in her tent by now, sheepish when I woke her up. I started on her intended trail, the sun already starting to dip below the giant sequoias. These woods, they have two faces. By day they're all dappled sunlight and birdsong, safe and familiar. But come twilight, something shifts. The shadows get long and strange and an uneasy silence falls. Makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. A few hours in, I found her campsite. It had been ransacked, gear scattered everywhere. There were footprints, big ones, leading into the trees. But the oddest part, the thing that made my skin crawl, was the blood. Small flecks of it, spattered across the ground, leading deeper into the woods. I called for backup, voice shaking over the radio. As the sun set completely, that's when I saw it. Hulking figure, silhouetted against the fading light. It had to be well over seven feet tall, its limbs too long and thin to be human. The face, it was more skull than face, a long snout ending in rows of sharp teeth, and its eyes, a burning, toxic yellow that seemed to bore into my soul. My instinct screamed at me to run, but somehow, I managed to draw my gun and fire a warning shot. The thing didn't flinch. It let out a hissing sound, like a snake crossed with a rusty pipe, and charged. I ran blind, branches tearing at my face, the creature's rasping breath hot on my heels. I must have tripped and fallen a dozen times in that frantic scramble. I could hear it gaining fast its guttural growls echoing in the twilight. Every rustle seemed like it was right behind me, those yellow eyes gleaming through the shadows. And then, a gunshot rang out. Not mine. The creature shrieked, and I heard it crashing off into the undergrowth. A moment later, my backup team found me, wild-eyed and clutching my empty pistol. I tried to babble about what I saw, but my words caught in my throat. They didn't see whatever I'd seen. They only saw my terror. Of course, they didn't believe me. Standard animal attack protocol. Bear or mountain lion, they figured. Told me to get some rest, that the adrenaline would wear off, and my mind would clear. My protests went ignored. Brianna's body was never found. The report was filed neatly away, another hiker lost to the wilderness. The whispers around the station started soon after. Cracked under the pressure, they'd say with a shake of their heads. The only person who seemed to understand was old Harlan, local ranger, been with search and rescue for decades. He pulled me aside a week later, his voice low. There's things in these woods. Things ain't meant for our eyes. Sometimes people go missing and ain't no trace of them ever found. Best left alone, son best left alone. I still patrol these woods, but it's different now. I'm always looking over my shoulder, sensing that I'm being watched by those cold, yellow eyes. Sometimes when the wind whispers through the trees, I hear that hissing sound, a haunting echo of that night. I've even caught glimpses once or twice, a flash of skeletal limbs, too high off the ground, moving too fast to be natural. The folks back at the station, they treat me different now. I see the pity in their eyes, hear the whispers behind my back. 
They don't understand. They haven't felt that unnatural hunger radiating from the depths of the forest, haven't seen the two sharp teeth or the long, bone-white claws. Harlan, he understands. We nod to each other across the room, a silent acknowledgement of the darkness we now carry. People keep asking about Brianna, expect us to eventually stumble across her remains, find some closure. They tell themselves there's a reasonable explanation, an animal attack, or she lost her footing and tumbled into a hidden ravine. I know better. I took some time off, told them I needed to clear my head, drove up the coast, tried to forget the feel of that creature's hot breath on my neck, the sound of its claws tearing at the earth. But you can't outrun that kind of fear. Even with the ocean breeze and crowds of tourists, I found myself flinching at shadows, jumping when a dog barked too suddenly. When I finally came back, it was because I couldn't stay away. These woods, they're in my blood. But I came back armed with more than my pistol and a radio. I spent hours in the dusty archives, reading old reports, local legends, anything that might offer a clue. Some tales spoke of a creature, thin and starved, with glowing eyes and a hunger for flesh. The native tribes called it the Briar Strider, said it haunted the deep woods and snatched people into the shadows. I don't know for sure what I saw that night, and maybe I don't want to, but I know this. Something is in those woods, something ancient and cruel, and maybe, just maybe, there's still a chance to stop it, or at least warn others. For Brianna, and for whoever else might wander those twilight trails unaware of the danger lurking in the ancient trees. This happened to me on July 14th, 2016. I'm Jonah, search and rescue in Yellowstone. Been patrolling these woods since I was old enough to hold a compass. Figured nobody knew them better than me. Lately, though, I'm not so sure. Got the call about a missing hiker early afternoon. Amelia, a solo traveler who never checked in with her family the night before. Started on her trailhead, found her car still parked there. Figured it was the usual scenario. Twisted ankle. Maybe she got turned around at some unmarked junction. Happens out here more often than you'd think. The trail wound deeper into the forest, the air thick and still under the summer sun found her pack about a mile in, ripped open, supplies thrown everywhere. No signs of a struggle, but something felt... off. That's when I saw it. A smear of blood on a tree trunk, dark streaks against the moss. My training kicked in, years of practice overcoming my first instinct to turn tail and run. Tracked the blood further into the woods. Then, I found Amelia... I'll spare you the details. There's a reason we're trained on how to tell the families, and none of the words make it any easier. But what got to me, what chills me to the bone, was the way she was... Arranged is the closest word I can stomach. Limbs bent at impossible angles, her skin stretched taut and pale, her eyes wide and staring, frozen in a scream that would never leave her throat. It was like something had taken her apart and put her back together wrong, just to see if it could. Then the silence of the forest shattered as a twig snapped nearby. I whirled around, rifle raised, and saw it. Standing just inside the tree line, almost invisible in the dappled shade, was the most unnatural thing I've ever encountered. It must have been ten feet tall, thin as a skeleton, skin stretched tight over bone, the head was all wrong, narrow, elongated, with a muzzle filled with sharp teeth. But the worst were the eyes. Hollow, black, yet burning with a predatory intelligence that made me feel less like a hunter and more like prey. For one terrifying, heart-pounding second, we locked eyes. Then it lunged forward with inhuman speed, and I ran. Branches tore at me but I kept going, fueled by blind terror. It was behind me, 
its long, spindly legs carrying it silently over the forest floor. I could hear its ragged breathing, the clicking of those unnatural claws against the rocks, smell its fetid, rotten breath. Then, a gunshot rang out. The creature shrieked, and for a second, I dared to hope. My backup team raced into the clearing, and as the creature melted back into the trees, I collapsed to the ground, gasping for air, unable to stop the shaking. The official reports said Amelia was killed by a bear, or maybe a mountain lion. They told the family they'd scared it off before it could mutilate the body any further. They gave me a long look when I insisted on describing the figure I saw, that too tall silhouette and those burning black eyes. Offered stress leave, counseling, the whole routine for folks who finally lost their grip on reality. I almost took them up on the offer too. Sometimes in the dead of night, I feel like I should have. It's hard to look at a map of Yellowstone and not picture that thing lurking among the trees, its impossible shape blending seamlessly with the shadows. They whisper tales like that in the local bars. Stories of hunters vanished without a trace. Hikers found broken and twisted deep within the woods. Stories about the strider, they call it. A predator too cunning and too unnatural for anyone to catch a clear glimpse of. Maybe I was supposed to fade away. Write it off as trauma. Leave the woods behind. But something in me, something stubborn and more than a little afraid, wouldn't let me. Instead, I stayed. I patrol my roots with a new sense of unease, always glancing over my shoulder and into the trees. I check the tree line before stepping into clearings, flinch at every snap of a branch. But there's a defiance in there too, a refusal to become another victim, another name whispered in hushed tones around a campfire. I haven't seen the strider since that day, but I know it hasn't forgotten me. Out there in the vastness of Yellowstone, under the ancient trees and silent sky, it waits. It remembers my fear, and it's patient. It knows I'll be walking its trails again, knows there'll be another hiker gone astray, another call that I'll have to answer. And when that day comes, when the forest falls silent and my footsteps lead me too deep into the shadowed woods, maybe it'll finally come to finish the hunt. This happened to me on July 4, 2001, back when I thought I'd seen it all. My name's Rick Donovan, search and rescue in Yosemite National Park for the past 10 years. Folks don't realize, a national park ain't just a big playground. It's untamed, and there are things out there that wouldn't think twice about having you for lunch. This particular summer, we had a rash of missing hikers. It started small. A young couple didn't return from a day hike, then an elderly lady out picking wildflowers just vanished. The usual theories floated around, accidents, maybe even foul play. But in the back of my mind, something prickled. Those disappearances felt off, the woods humming with a kind of wrongness. Then came the call about Jason and Emily Fuller, honeymooners from Texas, eager to explore Yosemite's splendor. Last seen heading toward Vernal Falls, one of the easier trails. I partnered up with Carter, a rookie, but keen. Armed with our gear and a good dose of skepticism, we set out. The trail wound us through a thick pine forest, the sun filtering through the dense canopy and dappled patches of light. City folk always seem surprised at how quiet it gets out there, like the world itself is holding its breath. Carter and I chatted. The usual stuff about sports and whether or not his wife would let him get that new fishing boat. About halfway to the falls, I spotted something. A flash of color snagged on a low-hanging branch. It was a scrap of fabric, a bright flowery pattern that screamed tourist. It matched the description of Emily Fuller's dress. My heartbeat quickened. Not a good sign. We pushed on, the ground rising beneath our feet. The forest began to thin, 
and the roar of the waterfall grew louder with each step. Then the trail split, one fork toward the falls, the other. It vanished into a dense thicket of manzanita bushes and scrub oak. Odd. It wasn't on any official map. Carter pointed at the makeshift trail. Think they wandered off the beaten path? I chewed my lip, unease gnawing at me. Maybe. Let's check out the falls first, spread out from there. We reached the base of the waterfall, its spray kicking up a cool mist that felt good against our sweaty faces. No sign of the fullers. Now worry was clawing its way up my throat. I gestured toward the thicket, the entrance a gaping shadow amidst the bright green foliage. Let's give this a look-see, I said, keeping my voice steady. We plunged in, branches snapping back in our wake. The makeshift trail was rough, the ground uneven. It twisted deeper and deeper into the dense growth, the waterfall's roar fading behind us. The air felt heavy, stagnant. A prickle ran down my spine, the sense of being watched intensifying with every step. Creepy in here, ain't it? Carter muttered, his voice low. Keep your eyes peeled, I replied, pushing back a wave of unease. Lost folks don't usually bushwhack into the heart of nowhere. Then we found it. A clearing, not a natural one. The manzanita bushes were hacked and torn, the ground trampled in a rough circle. And in the center, well, that's when my world tilted on its axis. They were bones human bones. They were picked clean. Something in that moment, a flicker of primal terror, told me this was not the work of a mountain lion. Rick. Carter's voice was barely a whisper. He didn't need to say more. My radio crackled to life. It was base camp, their voices tight with urgency. More missing persons reported, last seen near Vernal Falls. My blood ran cold. Whatever was out there, it was hungry. I made the decision right then. Carter, radio it in. Full evacuation of the trail. Get everyone back now. He sprinted back the way we came, his boots kicking up dust. I was alone. The only thing between that clearing and whoever was heading back toward civilization. I drew my gun. The weight of it a cold comfort. The weight was excruciating. Every rustle of leaves... Every snap of a twig had my heart hammering. That's when I saw it. Not the creature, just its handiwork. A fresh blood trail smeared across the low-hanging leaves. Something had dragged a body this way recently. I followed it, my gut twisting. Then the trees broke, and I stumbled out into a second clearing, much larger than the first. And that's where I saw it. The creature was hunched over something, a fresh carcass, the remnants of whoever had been unlucky enough to cross its path. I couldn't look away. It was immense, easily twice the size of a bear, its fur patchy and matted, revealing glimpses of mottled gray skin. Its limbs were too long, its hands tipped with claws that could tear through flesh like tissue paper. But it was the head, that elongated wolfish skull, the jaw dripping with blood, and the eyes. Those eyes burned a sulfurous yellow, devoid of anything remotely human. It lifted its head, and our gazes locked. Time seemed to freeze. In that instant, I became nothing more than prey. A guttural snarl ripped from its throat. The world exploded into action. I fired my gun, the shots echoing through the clearing. The creature lunged, its speed defying its size. I dove to the side, rolling for cover behind a fallen log. It shrieked in rage, swiping a massive paw and shredding the rotten wood like paper. I was on my feet, running blind, heart pounding a frantic drumbeat against my ribs. Branches tore at my clothes and skin, but I didn't slow down. Behind me, I heard the creature crashing through the undergrowth, its snarls growing closer with each passing second. My lungs burned with the exertion my vision blurring. Then, a flicker of hope. The main trail. I burst from the undergrowth, scrambling for the dirt path. Salvation, maybe. If I could make it to the falls, the crowds. 
Surely it wouldn't attack in plain sight. The creature erupted from the bushes behind me, a monstrous shadow against the fading light. I was running on pure adrenaline now, legs carrying me forward on instinct. The waterfall roared in my ears, growing louder with each desperate stride. And then, I tripped. A stray root snagged my boot, and I went sprawling, my gun flying from my hand. I scrambled to my feet, terror lending me a final burst of speed. The falls, only a few yards. It was on me in a heartbeat. Its fetid breath washed over me as I skidded to a halt at the edge of a sheer drop. I whirled around, the waterfall a deafening cascade behind me. Nowhere to run. The creature stalked forward, its yellow eyes gleaming. A low growl rumbled deep in its chest. This was it. The end of the line. I closed my eyes, a wave of bitter resignation washing over me. The roar of the waterfall filled my ears, mixing with the rasping snarls of the beast. I waited for the crushing blow, the tearing of claws. A scream pierced the air. Not mine. The creature let out a startled snarl, whipping its head around. A blur of movement above us. Carter standing precariously on a rock ledge halfway down the cliff. He held something in his hands. A flare. Over here, you ugly bastard, he yelled, his voice shaking. The creature hesitated, its yellow eyes flickering between me and Carter. Then, with a frustrated snarl, it turned and bounded toward the cliff face. Carter, bless his heart, lit the flare and hurled it with all his might. It sailed in a fiery arc, landing in a tangle of bushes near the base of the falls. The creature was instantly fixated on the flames. It let out a low, menacing growl but didn't move any closer. Carter scrambled down the cliff face, his movements clumsy but swift. He reached me, eyes wide with terror. Come on, come on! We retreated, slowly, keeping a wary eye on the creature. It stalked back and forth, agitated but wary of the fire. We reached the main trail, then broke into a full-out run, the roar of the falls and the creature's enraged snarls fading as we put distance between us and that unholy clearing. We didn't stop until we reached the ranger station, bursting through the doors covered in sweat, scratches, and fear. The nightmare wasn't over. Far from it. We faced evacuations, questions, official reports. The woods around Vernal Falls were closed for months. They never found any sign of the Fullers, or any of the others who disappeared. And they never found the creature. Sometimes, I swear I can still feel its eyes on me, hot and hungry. They call it the Skin Stealer now, in whispers around campfires. And on quiet nights, out in the wilderness, I think I sometimes hear its snarl echoing in the darkness. This happened to me on October 6, 2015. Call me Ben, search and rescue in Sequoia National Forest. Been on these trails since I could walk, thought I knew every twist and turn like the back of my hand. That was before, well, before. Couple weeks back, a solo hiker, Wyatt Ellis, missed his check-in date. Had permits for an overnight loop trail. His car was still at the trailhead. That familiar dread settled in my gut. Folks think getting lost can't happen to them. But these woods, they don't care how experienced you are. My partner Jenna and I loaded up and headed out. Wyatt was a seasoned type, but the weather had been unpredictable. Sudden storms could blow in over the peaks and disorient even the best. The first few hours went to routine, following footprints, checking the usual spots off trail where folks get turned around. We called Wyatt's name until our throats went raw. No answer, just the wind whispering through the pines. Near dusk, we found it. Not Wyatt, but a campsite. Wasn't marked on any map, not an official one. It was... wrong. Tent ripped to shreds, clothes scattered. Sleeping bag unrolled, the material slashed to ribbons, the feathers drifting about the clearing like dirty snow. 
Worst of all, there was blood, smeared across a rock, already drying brown. I knelt down, touching the rough stone, still tacky, fresh. We radioed it in, my voice tight. This wasn't just a missing person anymore. Something happened here, something bad. It was getting dark and fast. Jenna wanted to retreat, wait for backup, but that clawing dread in my gut, it told me we didn't have the luxury of time. We pushed on, following a faint trail leading deeper into the woods. Then we saw the bones. Human, scattered across the soft earth. Not old, picked clean. No animal did this. My stomach churned with a new kind of fear. Beside the remains, half hidden in the leaves, was Wyatt's backpack. We'd found him. Well, what was left of him? Jenna let out a choked sob. We both knew. This wasn't a tragic accident anymore. This was something far worse. We had to get out of there. I turned to go, and that's when I saw it. A flicker of movement on the edge of the clearing. It stood behind a massive redwood, cloaked in shadows. But I glimpsed those eyes, burning yellow orbs, fixed on us. And something else. A shape too big, too long, even in the dim twilight. Jenna, go! I yelled, pure terror fueling my voice. She didn't need telling twice. I heard her crashing through the brush as I reached for my sidearm. I had to buy us some time. That's when the creature stepped fully out of the shadows and my blood ran cold. It was immense, easily twice the size of a bear, its legs corded with unnatural muscle. The fur was patchy and mottled, stretched over bulging muscles. Its skull looked wolfish, but elongated, the jaws impossibly wide. And the eyes, those terrible yellow eyes, filled with a chilling, focused malice. I fired off a warning shot. The roar echoed through the trees, but it didn't even flinch. It lowered its head, and I saw wicked claws glistening at the end of its two long paws. Fear propelled me backward, and I stumbled over a root, falling hard. I tasted blood, bit back a cry as I fumbled for my dropped gun. Through blurry vision, I saw it charging, not lumbering like a bear, but moving with terrifying speed propelled by those massive, powerful limbs. I just managed to roll aside as it crashed into the space where I'd been a heartbeat before. I scrambled up and ran blindly, not looking back, just following Jenna's panicked shouts. The creature's roars of frustration shook the trees, its footsteps pounding behind us. Ahead, I saw a break in the trees, the moonlit silhouette of the ranger station shimmering in the distance. Hope surged through me. Maybe, just maybe, we'd make it. Jenna tripped over an exposed root, her ankle twisting with a sickening crack. I skidded to a halt, swearing. No way I was leaving her. Come on, I yelled, hauling her up. But we were slowing down. The creature was gaining ground, its snarls a cacophony of rage echoing in the night air. We burst from the tree line into the ranger station's clearing, the moonlight bright and harsh. I spotted my truck, keys still in the ignition. Safety felt so close, so agonizingly out of reach. Jenna screamed. I whipped around. The creature lunged from the shadows, landing squarely on Jenna's back. She hit the ground with a sickening thud, her body jerking beneath the monster's weight. I saw its jaws close around her neck, heard the crunch of bone. Blind animal instinct took over. I roared charging the creature. I slammed into its side, knocking it slightly off balance. Jenna thrashed beneath it, blood gurgling from her mangled throat. For a desperate moment, I thought I might wrestle her free. Then it swiveled its head, those blazing eyes locking onto mine. With a snarl, it shook off my meager strength, sending me sprawling. As it straightened, I saw the full extent of its grotesque form in the moonlight. The inhuman limbs, the dripping jaws, the pure evil in its eyes. Frozen with horror, I watched it stalk toward me. This was it. This was how I died. And then, headlights, screeching tires. 
backup had finally arrived, summoned by Jenna's earlier frantic calls. The rangers opened fire, shouting. The noise, the lights, they spooked the creature. With a final snarl filled with frustrated rage, it vanished back into the darkness. The aftermath is a blur. Explanations, reports, condolences. They labeled Wyatt and Jenna's deaths an animal attack, easier to swallow than the monstrous truth. But I saw what I saw. Some of the older rangers, they looked at me with knowing eyes. They had stories, too. Whispers passed among those who'd patrolled these woods long enough. Whispers about the Shredder, some call it, with a grim laugh that doesn't quite mask the fear. I don't patrol alone anymore. My eyes scan the tree line constantly, and at night, every creak of a branch, every rustle of leaves sends my heart pounding with icy terror. Because I know, deep down, it's still out there. It has a taste for human flesh now, and once the Shredder has tasted you, it doesn't forget. This happened to me on October 10, 2003. I was working for the Forest Service up in Maine then, in the shadow of Mount Katahdin. Grew up a city boy, but those thick northern forests, with their quiet and the scent of pine, got into my blood pretty quick. Name's Finn. October's tricky weather in Maine. You get days with crisp air and leaves like fire, perfect for search and rescue duty. Others, the fog rolls in, thick and wet, making the trees look like ghosts. That day started out nice enough. I was called in about a missing hiker, an older woman named Marjorie, last seen on a trail near the park's edge. Routine enough, figured she'd gotten turned around, would be waiting back at her car, all apologetic by sundown. Something felt wrong, though. Even with the fall colors, those woods weren't the type to hide a person easily. The trails were well-maintained, and even an off-path wander shouldn't have taken her out of earshot from the parking lot. I started my search, calling out Marjorie's name every so often, listening for a weak reply. The trail wound deeper into the forest, and a nagging sense of unease settled in my stomach. When I came upon the remains of her campsite, that dread turned to ice. It was torn to shreds. Camping gear was scattered. Her pack was ripped open. Food spilled everywhere. Something had been in a hurry, a very hungry hurry. Found Marjorie a few yards further, or what was left of her. I won't detail it, not here. Suffice to say, no bear leaves a body arranged like that. Whatever did this took its time, like it was... enjoying itself. My stomach turned, but I forced myself to focus. Had to figure out what the hell I was dealing with. That was when I saw the tracks. Now, I know my main wildlife, seen my share of moose prints, and the occasional big cat paw. These were different. Huge, like a bear but too many toes and claw marks gouging the earth. I started following them, feeling a mix of duty and something close to a hunter's instinct kick in. The fog rolled in as I tracked deeper into the woods. Visibility dropped, and every rustle of leaves had me jumping. Then, through the mist, I saw it. Hunched between two pines, back turned to me. Even at a distance... It was bigger than any animal has a right to be. Its skin was leathery and mottled, clinging tight over bones that seemed to jut out at wrong angles. And the head, the head was small and misshapen, barely covered in Apache fur, with eyes that glinted red even in the gloom. It turned. My heart pounded in my ears. That's the thing about fear. When it hits that peak, it flips a switch in your brain. For a moment, time seemed to slow down. I saw the too wide mouth, full of teeth designed for shredding, not chewing. The claws on its long, emaciated arms. And I registered that, even hunched over, this thing towered a good foot above me. Then the switch flipped back, and I was running. I heard it give chase, heard the crash of branches and something like a howl that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. 
I didn't dare look back, just ran until I burst out of the tree line and into the clearing around the visitor's center, collapsed on the asphalt, gasping for breath. My partner, Jenna, was the first one to reach me. I could barely get the words out, choked and rambling about monsters and teeth and blood. They all found me a mess, the other rangers, I mean, but Jenna's eyes held something different. Not pity, not disbelief, recognition, maybe. Later, once I'd calmed down enough to form coherent sentences, Jenna pulled me aside. Turns out her grandpa hailed from one of the local tribes, told her the old stories growing up. Stories about hungry spirits lurking in the deep woods, drawn to desperation and violence, taking on monstrous forms. The Wendigo, they called it. Seemed like just another campfire legend to scare kids into behaving. Jenna didn't say outright she believed my story. Maybe she wasn't sure herself. We searched the area, found Marjorie's remains, the shredded campsite. But my tracks were the only clear ones leading away. No trace of the creature despite combing the woods. The official report was filed, the cause of death listed as undetermined animal attack. They sent me home, offered counseling, like it was the shock talking not whatever I'd seen out there. Didn't feel right to accept, like it would make my memory less real. What was the point of therapy when the nightmares were truer than anything a shrink could tell me? I left Maine soon after. Couldn't shake the image of that thing. Couldn't walk in the woods without feeling eyes on me. Every crack of a branch I jumped. Got a job working in Yellowstone for a while. But the mountains didn't make it much better. The open space just left me feeling more vulnerable. Sometimes, I swore I caught whiffs of that rotting, sweet smell in the wind, carrying across miles of mountain range. These days, I work desk duty for the service, mostly logistics stuff. I keep my gun close, even in the office, a habit my boss gives me a hard time about. They ask why I don't quit, find some quiet office job in the city. Fact is, I can't seem to turn my back on the woods entirely. I guess there's a part of me, however small, that still believes part of my job is watching, listening for whatever else might be lurking out there. Sometimes, late at night, I think I catch that scent on the wind, a chill that has nothing to do with the AC washing over me. It makes me wonder how many other cases like Marjorie's there are, disappearances and mangled bodies blamed on animals. Makes me wonder if she was unlucky, or just the first course. And it makes me wonder, is that thing still out there, growing stronger, bolder, its hunger never satisfied? This happened to me on October 12, 2008. I remember it well. It was the start of the fall hunting season and I was already deep in the Stanislaus National Forest on an extended search and rescue mission. Not one of the feel-good ones, those rarely last more than a day or two. This one was different. A family of five, gone missing nearly a week earlier. A couple, their two kids, and the grandmother. Vanished during a weekend camping trip. I'm Derek Morgan, search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. We get these calls far too often. City folk underestimate how unforgiving the wilderness can be. Heck, sometimes even seasoned outdoorsmen get a harsh reminder that nature doesn't play by our rules. We'd found their campsite days ago, torn to shreds. Not by any animal I recognized. At least, none that would leave the grandmother's bloodied glasses untouched in the middle of the mess. I knew from the start, we wouldn't be bringing back any smiles with this one. It felt different. Wrong. They called me in because I'm good at tracking, and even better at the terrain here. I've been working in these mountains all my life, know them like the back of my hand. Problem was, even I saw absolutely no sign of the family. It was like they'd up and disappeared into thin air. A knot started to grow in my stomach, the nagging feeling that something wasn't right. October 12th. My partner Mike and I were combing through a particularly rough patch of forest on a hunch. One of those gut feelings, you know? 
The undergrowth here was so dense you couldn't move ten feet without a machete. I swear, every vine seemed out to snag us, every branch eager to break and trip us up. Even in the fall, this place was a damn sauna. Rookie, any chance you could get that sweat out of your eyes? Can't see a damn thing. I grunted at Mike. Kid had potential, but he was clumsy. That's when we found it. A small cave, hidden behind a thick curtain of vines. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but trust me. In a place like this, any cave that hasn't been charted already is a red flag. You start thinking about what kind of critters might call an unknown cave home. Mike was the brash one, the kick-the-door-down type. We gotta check it, Derek. The family could be holed up in there, he shouted, eyes wide. Keep your pants on, rookie, I chuckled, though I felt that same knot in my stomach tightening. We'll check, but careful now. We approached, machetes in hand, and as we got closer, that smell hit us rotting, gut-churning. It wasn't natural, not just some dead animal. There were flies, so many flies, buzzing in a thick black cloud. I peeked inside. What I saw will haunt me forever. It wasn't the family. It couldn't be. The flesh had been stripped to the bone, clothes torn to shreds. Human, definitely, but also not. The bodies, there were three of them, were contorted, twisted into unnatural positions. Their mouths were frozen open in silent screams. Their eyes... God, those eyes were wide with a terror I hoped to never witness again. And above them, perched on a rock ledge, was... It. A humanoid shape, but taller, gaunt. Skin stretched tight and glistening with a sheen that wasn't sweat or water. Massive eyes, solid black bored into mine like it saw into my very soul. A scream caught in my throat as it lunged. I don't remember much after that. A blur of teeth, of claws. Then Mike, yelling, gunshots, and the creature disappearing back into the darkness. Somehow I stumbled out of the cave, Mike pulling me along. Blood streamed down my face. I felt it, my nose, half torn from my skull. We ran, pushed by primal terror, branches ripping at our clothes, thorns tearing at our skin. Every crackle of a twig made us jump, thinking it was back on our tail. We didn't stop until we reached the ranger station, battered and bloodied. Our report sent shockwaves through the service, but nobody believed our description. After that, they started calling us the crazy ones. Mike quit, and rumors swirled. Drugs, hallucinations... You name it, they tried to pin it on us. This happened to me on October 12th, 2005. I'm Wyatt, search and rescue in Sequoia National Forest. Spent most of my life around these parts. Figured this job was the best way to give back to the place that raised me. Seen a lot, but nothing. And I mean nothing like what I'm about to tell you. Start of the day was normal enough. Got called about two hikers missing on an overnight trip. Experienced couple, Tracy and Rhett. Figured they got turned around, maybe a minor injury, something routine. My cell signal cut out as I drove further back into the park, but that wasn't unusual. We get a lot of dead zones around those ancient trees. The trail wound through an old growth section of the park, the giant sequoias towering all around. Always feel a bit small out there, but it's a good small, you know? Like you're a part of something ancient and grand. That feeling of peace vanished as soon as I found their campsite. Or more accurately, the wreckage of it. It was like a bomb went off. Tent was shredded to ribbons, supplies scattered everywhere, and there was blood. So much blood. Blood and weird marks on the ground like something big had been dragged. No animal I ever saw made tracks like that. Then I saw Tracy's body. Well, what was left of it? It's hard to describe. Torn apart, but in this precise, methodical way. Not like a bear or mountain lion would do. 
My stomach turned, but I forced myself to keep a level head. Search and rescue training kicked in. Assess, report, secure the scene. That's when panic set in. My radio wasn't working. Just static. I tried everything. Swapped batteries. Moved to higher ground. Nothing. That's when I saw it lurking at the edge of the trees. Tall. God. Impossibly tall. At least eight feet. Its limbs were like thin branches. Bone white. Jutting at weird angles. Skin stretched tight over its frame. Showing every rib. The head... That's what really got me. Long, narrow skull, teeth like a row of needles. Its eyes, though, that's the worst part. Pure black, shining with this cold hunger. My fight or flight kicked into overdrive. I froze for a second. Then the creature hissed and lunged. Ran blind, scrambling up a rocky incline, the thing's claws scraping the stone behind me. It was gaining its ragged breathing echoing off the trees. Took a desperate gamble and veered off the path, scrambling down a ravine. Lost my footing, tumbled the whole way down. Hit my head hard, must have blacked out. When I came to, it was dusk, and I was alone. I patched myself up best I could, cut up and bruised to hell, but alive. Started stumbling back towards the ranger station, my flashlight cutting a weak path through the growing darkness. Took me the better part of the night. Every crack of a branch, every rustle behind me, I thought it was that thing. The walk back felt endless, the isolation crushing. It was like the whole forest was watching me, holding its breath. When backup finally found me the next morning, I was a babbling mess. They took one look at me, the scratches and the blood, and knew something wasn't right. Told them everything, my voice shaking the whole time. They never found a trace of Rhett, and the higher-ups wrote my report off as an animal attack, some deformed cougar, even with the weird tracks and Tracy's... what was left of Tracy. They gave me a long leave to recover from my injuries. That's fine. Let them think I'm crazy. Me, I know what I saw. I haven't gone back to those woods since, not alone. Took a desk job, still with the service, but away from the deep trails. Can't stomach the thought of seeing that empty black stare again. Word trickled down that I wasn't the only one either. Fellow rangers whispering about sightings of something just on the edges of the trees, something tall and skeletal with gleaming eyes. Hikers who vanish without a trace. Sometimes I wonder if whatever that creature was, if it isn't part of these old forests, not some mutated animal, but something that's always been there, hidden in the deep shadows. Locals have tales, going back generations, about the tall walker and those who cross its path. Maybe I should have paid those stories more attention, taken them as more than just campfire spooks. Maybe someday I'll get the courage to go back, to face the thing that haunts my nightmares, to figure out if it's even killable. For now, I'll stick to the well-lit trails and leave the ancient woods to their secrets. I'll leave them to the whispers of the tall walker and try to forget those impossible yellow eyes staring out at me in the dark.